What do we think of this reading? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, we're, you know, when you get into these types of philosophers, there's a lot that they're approaching this with, you know, uh, I want to say, they're trying to prove their point by doing these thought experiments and stuff, and the thought experiments get elaborate. Uh, you know, it's not a winning thing for me. I mean, personally, I mean, could you imagine, like, somebody like Derek Parfit trying to have a conversation with, say, Socrates? He'd stop the whole thing, you know. We're not so. But you're trying. I'm trying to give you an impression of the self, and just giving you a variety. This is not how, you know, Augustine would look at it. Uh, he would he would not ask these same questions. But once you get into mostly reductionist mode, like some of these modern philosophers are, you know, they don't have the continuity that a deity or some tradition might provide. So they have to say, well, then what is it? And you know. It's at least good that you have heard of it and you you know given that it's shot. If you don't find it convincing, well, that's quite all right. You know, um, I don't always find it convincing, but the reality is is that you can appreciate somebody's work. You can even understand it without agreeing with it. As a matter of fact, it's probably better that you understand it. So if you disagree with it, you're disagreeing with something that you understand. Um, we can go back to politics and see how many times people argue about stuff that's really outside of the domain, and that gets a little frustrating. So at the very least, it's an it's an appreciative type thing. Um, you've heard it, the name may not be familiar, but at least you know, you're going to see some alternatives to psychological continuity uh, that may have rang true for us with Locke, even though we didn't quite get it. You know, they're all trying to chip away and see what they can get to. So in that sense, it's a little bit you know, of uh, maybe a worldwide dialectic. Everybody keeps throwing something on the wall and we're seeing what sticks. All right. Um, nonetheless, let's get into... So, we have a little difference here with uh, Derek Parfit. He, he's born in China. Uh, Chengdu, am I saying that correctly? Uh, he's, he's British. Uh, his parents, I, I don't know if it would be proper to call them missionaries. They, had, they did something with uh, medical help. As, but I'm guessing Christian missionaries only because they came from Britain. But they moved back to Britain when he was one year old. And because of theodicy, theodicy is the problem of evil in the world. Why do good thing, bad things happen to good people, and how can a, a benevolent God allow all this to happen? He lost his, his faith and um, became an atheist, which maybe sets up his idea of, you know, his reductionist understanding of the human person. Uh, nothing any philosopher does is that isolated, you know, in the that's something else. In the ancient world, they would never have seen all these divisions like we have today. So for somebody who's teaching practical philosophy or, you know, applied, let's say, ethics, or somebody's teaching ontology or metaphysics, you know, we see these all little separate disciplines. They did not. So he was very much concerned with, you know, the ethical input, like how, like, he was opposed to utilitarian views of ethics. It doesn't make sense to him that people should simply act in their own uh, self-interest. Um, now, there's a lot of different applications of utilitarianism, but nonetheless. So part of this was the response to some of that. Um, and we'll see what he means by that. And I guess you can say that he sort of reframed the discussion. You know, rather than asking questions about personal identity, in other words, how is this future self like the past self, he kind of spins it around and says, why are we so interested, you know, why is our ego so interested in this future self? You know, maybe it's the self and relationality um, with other people that are more important. Now, there's a lot of different ways to understand some of the things he says. And to be honest, I'm just going to give you a flavor of it. I'm not interested in recreating, you know, each of his arguments and how they work. I want to give you a flavor of this. And that, actually, the next thing that we'll talk about on Friday is sort of a rebuttal to some of him and some of the people that came before him. So you're probably going to see and recognize some of the readings. I think the second or third part of the next reading is pretty much you know, a, re a regurgitation of uh, Parfit or such, uh, certainly through Loth. Um, so nonetheless, um, that's his goal. So, you can, so if you get a picture in the back of your mind, like you know, how somebody's, if you want to call it a worldview, how it motivates them. He's concerned with the ethics, like how, what is our relationality? He doesn't want to see that egotistical type utilitarianism where we're only worrying about how to achieve what we want to achieve. Uh, he doesn't quite have a faith to hang any continuity on, so he's going to look for it in other ways. 
and he's going to start questioning what he's received and say, well, is it really necessary that we have this die-hard connection with the future self? Maybe we should be more concerned with, you know, what is going on in our own life and then how that then um, connects to those around us, and he'll go from there, all right? So that's just kind of his idea, anyway. I guess I already mentioned that. Now, I'm not a Buddhist scholar, but is anybody here familiar with the Buddhist concept of no self? Perhaps? Anybody? I don't like that no self, because I know that like, it's like the, like the suffering. Um, yeah, that's like, part of it. Like, the noble truth, yes. Yeah, because you like, um, accept that like, the suffering doesn't really, like you kind of change your outlook on everything. So that's right. So, you know, again, I'm not a, a, a scholar on this idea, uh, but, you know, you have the, you know, the, the asynchronous self, like, you know, how, what's our continuity with us in the future? And then you have, like, even the synchronous self, like, you know, wh who are we right now? So I guess basically the idea that there's no self, this is not like a type of nihilism that denies, you know, that there's anything here or that we have some reality. That's not it. But it would deny that there's some underlying substance, all right? So there's no soul in this theory. There's no soul that provides continuity um, from one to the past. It's, re it's really just a sense that uh, th there's some causal psychological, this causal relations of a psychological continuity. And if that sounds kind of vague, that's perfectly fine. Uh, they actually think that a lot of this, they would call it bad metaphysics of the self, leads to the suffering that they're trying to undo. Um, don't get so fixated on this. Uh, so it doesn't leave you in a state of like, well, then what do you mean if there's no self, I'm not here? That's not what they're trying to, to drill at. But they're, they're, you can see right off the bat that they're not going to aim for something that is necessarily you and only you. In other words, it, it's almost like the parts don't add up to a whole. And I don't want you to understand this like we've talked about philosophers in the past that saw the soul of maybe parts or such or a unity. What they're saying is that you, you have a collection of memories, you have a collection of psychological responses, you have a collection of rational thoughts, you have parts, you know, we have hands and feet and fingers and all the other things. And if you were to take some of those away, you would still be you. Um, you can lose some of your memories, you can lose some of these parts in your body and such. And if you took all of those things away, there would be nothing. In other words, you're really a collection of all of these things. So there's no central thing there that you can put your finger on and say, that's the self, that's the human person, it's the soul. That, that would deny this. So he kind of uh, found comfort in that and actually you know, used that, or maybe, I'm not sure what the relationship was. You would need somebody who's more of a you know, scholar just on parfait. He died recently, 2017. So it hasn't been too long that he hasn't been a contemporary philosopher. Um, but you need somebody that would know a lot more about him as a personhood and see which one influenced more. You know, was he attracted to this Buddhism understanding of no self because it fit the worldview that he saw, or was he attracted to it and then because he was attracted to it, started to discover it as a worldview? I'm, I couldn't really speak on that issue. Um, but nonetheless, uh, let's see. Okay. Now, you remember from Locke, the prince and the cobbler, right? So we just had an exchange of consciousness. The prince became the cobbler. Well, the consciousness of the prince went into the cobbler, and the consciousness of the cobbler went into the prince. So we had this exchange, and then we tried to say that the consciousness, or the, the memories, is the way Locke was putting it, that was the actual person. So the, um, the prince, in a sense, we could say survived. Um, his essence survived, even though he's in the body of the cobbler. We could say the cobbler, his essence, survived, although it survived in the body of the prince. Uh, he's going to do something a little different here, right? He's going to uh, actually uh, split these things. Um, the fission, what we'll say, right? So, and, and, and these, that's actually, this isn't all fiction, all right? So, uh, is it the corpus callosum, I think, the bundle of nerves between the brains? So, Back in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, you know, we've come so far with mental health, right? So if you have any, like, great-grandparents or such that might have suffered, I don't know, schizophrenia or whatever that might have been identified as, you could almost disregard it because it, there were so many things that were all bundled in with the same thing. They could have just had depression. Uh, they could have had uh, epilepsy. It's almost impossible to say. 
Um, but this was one treatment for epilepsy. They thought, you know, we can control the seizures and such if we just sever the two spheres. So they did. Um, but the idea was is that we would have now two separate streams of consciousness within the same individual. Now, there's been enough studies since, at least the one I'm aware of, that that's not true. <laughs> um, you know, if the left brain controls the right side and the right controls the left, they find that it still has functions, that we don't have two separate streams of consciousness going on. But let's just leave it that there is for the sake of his experiment. Because remember, he's going to use thought experiments to try to make his point. So um, even though I may not entirely buy into him and you may not entirely buy into him, let it play out and see if he can at least make his point as he moves along. So you're going to take, so I'm, I'm just, I like when things stay the same. So rather than try to use some other symbolic you know, images up there, let's just stick with the prince and the cobbler because that way we're all, we know what those two figures are. All right? So, bless you. The first idea is, okay, so we're going to split, you know, the, the brain, and we're going to take half the brain and put it into this other body and put the other half of the brain and then put it into this other body. We'll just say um, the new prince and the new cobbler, okay? He's asking a question, you know, like, you know, what, what are my options here? When he talks about survival, he's talking about survival of what, we would normally say is the continuity of the essence of the person, okay? And he's saying, well, really, in this regard, the original prince doesn't survive at all um, because whatever is in half the stream of the consciousness is now in another individual and likewise with the other half of the sphere of the brain. So he says, really, what we have is we have these two new um, particular, um, well, let's say, you know, entities or persons. Now, he, he sort of works out, if you read through it, he says, you know, we have a few options here. You know, could it just survive in the prince or could it just survive in the, in the um, cobbler? He says it, it's either going to survive in neither or both. I mean, he, that doesn't make sense. You would have no argument to say one or the other, right? But he's also going to say then, are either of these things like the original? Um, and here he's going to say, well, not really, right? But he, before we get to that, he's going to say there is a different way to look at this. In other words, if we're looking at it as like a branch, you know, or a canal, and that's why I'm not going to try to get in and try to dis uh, display his particular mechanisms for ex making his explanations. Let's leave it at that. But he says if we're talking about the branch, that's one thing, but if we're going to talk about like a stream of consciousness where we don't have, like, in other words, a canal may just be on this, you know, path only. But if we could talk about a stream, how maybe these both things are on the same stream, could be a different situation per se, right? Uh, he says neither are the original prince, but see, his, his point is it doesn't matter. That, his whole point is, remember, we're talking about this no self. So he's starting out by saying we're really asking the wrong questions. We're trying to ask, in essence, you know, which one of these survive? Because we want to know that who we are now remains who we will be in the future. That's kind of been where some of the thinkers that we've looked at so far were concerned about. You know, what, I, what makes me the same person as I was when I was young? Um, you know, and he's getting to the point where he said, it just it doesn't matter, all right? Um, it's the fact that there's something there that survived and there's something new that survived. And we've got to overcome this obsession, or what he would almost term like an egotistical <laughs> obsession, with a future self. Uh, remember, he's going to say that, you know, we're not going to be the same selves we are in the future. We're not even quite the same selves that we are now. Uh, and we talk like this, right? I mean, we'll probably get into this a little bit more. But how many times, like, colloquially, that we might be talking to somebody and say, well, that's not me anymore, you know? Oh my God! Well, I was ten. I was immature. You know, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> Whoever did that, Mom, that's not me. I mean, you know. So you know, it's that we don't talk like that. You know, so it's maybe as you know, a little unplausible. Some of his questions might be. They come up in our daily lives. Uh, you know, what would be some continuity? You know, say between the, the, our cells, like pre in gestation in the womb. How would we talk about ourselves there? And how would we talk about ourselves the same way towards the end of the life if we're in some vegetative or cognitive state? Um, you know, what's the continuity? And he's trying to say it, it's really, we've been hanging our hats on this 
personal identity, and he's like, I'm not sure it's there. There's some psychological causal thing that perhaps are connecting all of this, but he said there's no self underneath it all. You know, remember, if you took away, you know, my hand, if you cut somebody's hair off, if you wiped out one or two memories, if you, you know, changed a personality, um, you can keep going and going, and if you take it all away, there's nothing. And that's what he means by there's no self, nothing's left at the end, all right? Now, that's a particular view of the human person, so as a little bit of an aside, you know, we all choose an ethic, right? Remember, I have kind of mentioned it off the, uh, off the bat once before, there's no default ethic. It's not like, well, I just do what we do. Um, everybody chooses an ethic. It's usually based on an understanding of the human person. People are not usually reflective enough to want to sit down and try to say, what's my understanding of the human person? We've kind of like, think we'll figure it out as we move along. Um, so maybe that would fit into what he's saying. It's almost like our opinions on ourselves and who we are develop also. But you still have to have some sort of overarching view. This, I mean, the Buddhist view of no self is an opinion on the human person, all right? And it, and it moves out from there. So you would, if, if you were doing some sort of ethics, even a bioethics from a Buddhist point of view, you could talk about a lack of consistency and say, well, that doesn't really follow your understanding of the human person. You do that. It doesn't matter in what we do that. We'll do that, too, um, in our own ethics. It's like we want to be consistent. And that's part of the problem. We're not. We're kind of like all over the board, right? So he sees a very deep connection between this extension of personal identity into the future and our views that we want that and how it's going to play out in our own ethics, which is why he you know, really combats utilitarianism per se. Right. Anyway. Um, so, well, I guess I was already started talking about that. He just thinks that we're just hanging our hat a little bit. Too much on that per se. Let me see if there's anything else. Um, Yeah, I guess just make sure you get that out of that. He's not as concerned as, as Locke would have been that the original prince remains the prince, even if the original prince is in a different body. That, um, that one, the idea that one remains one just doesn't ring true with him. There's got to be, and, he, and again, he's not into the personal identity thing as much. He's going to be a little bit more into this like um, stream of psychological continuity and how that might be, but he doesn't tag it all on memories. And he starts, he starts to talk about it that way. Did anybody pick up what he said on Q? Did you know Q memory meant quasi, by the way? I'm not sure if it said that in the text. Um, I don't know if by just the context you might have picked that up or not. Did anybody understand what he was saying about with Q memory? It's not his idea. It was Q memories. Um, it's a little odd. And I'll have, to, you know, I'll have to tell you without, so I don't sound cynical in my voice as I try to explain it. It doesn't quite ring true with me. Uh, a lot of a lot of what I find in modern philosophy is almost like a play on linguistics, and it takes some time to sort through it all and see exactly how they are laying it out. But see, he's he think of this. Maybe this will help you understand where he's trying to go with this, if I understand it correctly. Um, if you're going to take like whatever it is that was in the original prince and then split it, and that's going to go into the um, the new prince and the new cobbler, you know, they don't have those same experiences. <coughs> but the memory is there somehow. So that, you know, that brings up a little bit of an issue. How do you really transfer a memory when you don't have the experience? You're experiencing, you're having memory of an experience you've never had. All right? So we'll have to, like, and, and this is, it wasn't clear in the reading, he didn't really differentiate, and other people have on his behalf, or I mean, he has other places, and they've commented on it. There's a difference between like what he would call a quasi-memory and like just flat out a, a pseudo-memory, okay, like a false memory and such. But here's the idea um, that can you have the memory of something that may or may not have happened in your life, but you still have the experience of that memory? That's gonna. That sounds weird. I know it does, right? Um, I tried to think of an example that would do this, and the only example I could come up with is what, what I would probably end up calling a pseudo-memory. Let's say that, you know, the princess loved to go to the cobbler to get her shoes made, and perhaps one time, you know, it, I don't know, she gave the impression that she was just going to, you know, kiss the cobbler on the cheek or something. But he has the memory of it, all right? Because part of the way that Parfit talks about this is there's a few conditions for his scenario to work. It's one that... 
someone had to have the memory. It had to be a real event, or it would just would be some pseudo thing. So this is almost I'm building a pseudo thing here the way I did it. But I couldn't think of another a better example. But nonetheless, um, the cobbler, for all intents and purposes, it's a genuine memory for him. You know, maybe this is a better way to do it. I've done this, okay? You don't have to be a bullshitter to, for this to happen to you. You just have to be old enough that your memory starts to slip a little bit. Have you ever started telling a story and then you stopped yourself and you literally thought, wait, that wasn't me. Have you ever done that? No? Well, you guys are just too young. That's your problem, you know? I'm telling you, you know, um, especially, you know, I, I won't tell you how long I've been out of school, but the reality is, is you get these things a little jumbled in your head, which is why, you know, I'm not trying to make any political comments, right? So, you know, um, there was some issue with Joe Biden having a few memory lapses, right? And I heard people come up and say, you know, look, sometimes these things do get jumbled in your mind. And that's exactly what I thought. Now, it doesn't matter if you care or don't care if it's a political candidate. You know, I always thought that we jumped on these things too quick, right? Sometimes you, you get older, it's, it's easy for things to get jumbled. Let's put it this way. Um, maybe this will help you. Maybe this is a good way to do it. Anybody here have siblings? Were you ever called by your sibling's name? It, it's not hard. You know, me and my wife sometimes even argue over who it was that said that. You know, um, that wasn't this person. That was this person. And I would probably, sometimes I would go to the mat. You know, and I was like, no, I know who that was. And she's like, no, it's wrong. And then all of a sudden, you know, she finds an old scrapbook photo. And you're like, holy crap. You know, now that wasn't, now... The question is, you know, things like that exist. So let's maybe put aside exactly how, because I, you know, I've read a few different versions of how it was explained to Q memories, and I keep thinking it seems very forced to me that you're explaining to somebody that you may not have the memory, but you have the experience of the memory. As long as you keep in track what he's trying to do, how could the new prince and the new cobbler who have both got a sphere of consciousness from the original prince they're going to have these memories, but they're not going to have the experiences. So I think his goal was, is how can we possibly talk about a memory that isn't connected to a direct experience? You know, and I thought about this and thought about it, and I even Googled it a couple of times just to see if anybody explained it well, and nobody did. And the best thing I can come up with is, there are those times in my life when I literally are telling somebody, like, wait, that's not me. And you catch yourself. Now, Let's be honest, if that does happen to you, and it will happen to you eventually, um, what do we say about that as far as a memory and as far as knowledge? We wouldn't call it a, you know, a fake memory. Maybe a quasi-memory is not a half-bad way to place it, right? It, we could say that it might be false, okay? So we'd have to play around with whether we like the word pseudo or quasi, but nonetheless, it's one of those two things. But it's still a genuine memory, and do we not at least share in the experience? I mean, as long as it seems right for us, why would we, we don't question it, so we continue on, right? Um, so his point is, come on, is that even though it's quasi, it, it could still be a genuine knowledge for the individual. Now, remember, he's not overly concerned with, you know, that the original prince survives. He doesn't think the original prince is going to survive in the new prince or the new cobbler. That's not his point. His point is, is we've got to stop looking for continuity in that particular direction. Because he goes, I don't think that that's going to be it. He says, we've got to stop pretending that all we're looking for is this future self is the same as the old self. He says, it doesn't matter. What does it matter to the future self? Because, you know, again, there's something to that. You know, to repeat it, there's often that we look back and say, that wasn't me. Um, or, you know, I remember... Um, Shawshank Redemption. Who are my Shawshank Redemption people in the house here? Somewhere? Right? So the, yeah, it's a great movie, right? Um, there was a, a time when the one, I can't remember the, the one character when he finally got paroled at, at the end, he just told, he told the parole committee, he goes, you know what, I don't care what you do, Sonny, stamp what you want to stamp. He says, whoever did those murders, that person's been dead a long time. And he says, so it doesn't matter to me what you do. And then they released him because he's on parole, because it must have convinced them that that's true. Well, that would almost be a case that would fit, you know, Parfit's, you know, scenario here. That was not you. 
You know, now we would have to come back if you say, well, no, I think there is a continuity. You'd have to go back and start the struggle and say, well, it is the continuity between that. Um, nonetheless, okay. So, in the end, what do you think? Do you think he at least shipped away any objection that there, at least theoretically, could be some memory transfer without the experience? It's a thought experiment. I don't know how it, it would ever pull out in life. I don't know how. I mean, I, I can't, I've been trying to think, and I can't envision it. Um, maybe if some of those surgeries where they were removing the, that bundle of nerves actually did provide two streams of consciousness, and maybe we could have, I don't know. And it's funny, too. I remember, like, I was a year ago when I was researching stuff for this course. Uh, it was in 2017 where in some neurosurgeon said that there'd be a, a, a successful head transplant within two years. Did anything happen? I haven't heard. You'd think that one to hit the news. Of course, it's hard to say. Um, but nonetheless, you know, who knows in the next, you know, 30, 40 years, uh, we'll see what happens. Um, they might start doing partial brain transplants. Wouldn't that be something? Um, who knows? There's going to be a lot of thing, exciting things to be done in medicine coming up. Uh, I was even reading about how they're, and I know this is off topic, but it just remind me, it's, you know, they really think on some cancers they're getting so close that they can turn them into chronic diseases, almost like uh, um, HIV. HIV back in the 80s was a death sentence. Um, but now, in very few cases, they can cure it. For the most part, they can make it chronic. It doesn't mean that it won't have some you know, implications for future health, but they can, it's no longer a death sentence, and they're thinking they can get that way with some cancers, turn them into just you know, long-term chronic illnesses. Wouldn't that be something, right? So who knows where they're going to go. Maybe some of the thought experiments that he's kind of throwing out there, these things always sound like science fiction, and then they eventually become realities. And, and, and the problem is, and this isn't a critique of medicine, right, because I do enough medical ethics, but... Some scientists typically will only ask what we can do, right? Because you get excited about it, it gets into the research, and if you don't have a, a deep, deep ethical background, you, you, you never stop and say, maybe we shouldn't do this. Or you start to conclude, well, somebody else will if I don't, why not me? That kind of thing, right? So who knows what's going to come out in the future. So anyway, his idea then is to kind of like just give up a little bit on this idea of, you know, the same person surviving. Because that's not the question to ask. Again, he's reframing it a little bit. And he says, there's still a connection, isn't there? I mean, even if we're going to say between the original prince, the new, I mean, the original prince, the new prince, and the new cobbler, there's still some sort of connection. I mean, there's still some sort of connection for you and I when we were in the gestational stage or womb intrauterine. Um, there's still some connection between you and I when we were, thir you know, three or five or 13. And there'll be some connection with you when you're 35 and 40, right? Um, and he says that's really what's important, that there's something that continues there, um, whatever that might possibly be. And, you know, there's other people, there's a lot of different theories we didn't go over, like Hume and such, that like this bundle of psychological expressions and everything. A lot of people have been trying to, like, you know, throw stuff against the wall and see what sticks here. But you can kind of see, too, how this is pretty drastically different than people like um, Plato or, or Augustine or such that would see a totally different, even Descartes, right? They would see a totally different... Um, understanding of um, the human person in continuity. You know, even Descartes, I think, you know, I wonder if he realized what some of his dualistic theories would have put out if he would have tried to, like, tamper it down or foresee some of that, because um, I'm not sure that it's hard to put words in their mouth what they would have accepted in the future, but I could see that he'd have a lot of contentions with um, some of these moderns, okay? <coughs> Although he probably would really appreciate the fact that they're chewing him up, because then he'd do that to everybody that came before him, so he'd at least appreciate that. So, you know, again, this is his question, and he's obviously going to disagree. You know, if with Locke, this personal identity was a matter of whatever was in A is in B, and then whatever is in B is in C, therefore, whatever is A is C, you know? And he says, that's gone. Um, and enough anecdotal experience and his thought experience, experiments kind of show him that that's not necessarily true. There's so much of us that, you know, as B, is that we weren't when we were at A. Um, and again, if you took away all that stuff, what would you have left, right? 
So rather than something that's transitive like that, he says, again, maybe this sounds like a cop-out to you, but it's where he lands. He says, let's just say that to some degree, we're still that person. Now that might be very easy to accept, right? Um, to some degree, you are the same person you were when you were four. To some degree, the same person you were when you walked in this room. Um, but you're not the same person as when you walked in this room. You're not the same person when you were four. So he's going to leave it at that. And he's going to just say that this is the connectedness. There's something there. Um, and I think, let me see if I can. I thought Shoemaker, which you guys didn't read. Let me see if I had it somewhere here. Well, we'll leave it at that. I thought there was somewhere in here I had a quote, but that's okay. Now, um, what he says is the, what, what becomes then the implication of all of this is that we have both a connection to who we were and who we are, and we also have a disconnection to who we were and who we are. So we could really say in a non-metaphorical way that that was not me that did that. You know? So if you did something really rotten to your parents you know, five years ago or so, and you apologize, or like my daughters, they thought all this was important until they had to pay for everything themselves, and all of a sudden they don't run to get slushies, and they worry about gas money, and they tell my wife, you know what, you were right. Um, if I had to go back again, I wouldn't do it. You know what, the person I am now, that wasn't me back then. I mean, there has to be something to that, right? I just, I, I don't know, what do you think, though? I mean, I, I almost get the impression, like, that doesn't get to the essence of who we are. What do you think about that? I mean, it's just an opinion. Well, is he arguing that there is no essence? Like, yeah, that's right. So, like, well, like, you can't really say that wasn't you because it was you, but, like, you have changed or that part of you has changed. So, like, yeah. that was me, but that is no longer me. Well, that's okay. He would agree with you, but he would go farther and say there never was an underlying essence of anything, all right? So any essentialism that you might have got from, like, an Aristotelian or a Socratic view or think of Platonic forms yeah. or think of Augustine's, you know, um, I guess you can call it the form that God provides, that's not there whatsoever. You know, which is why he adopts the kind of Buddhist thing. Um, this is part of like, okay, so, you know, those forms and everything are all, remember, we call them universals. Um, and you can think in terms of, the, of Plato and such, where the universal exists in a separate sphere by itself, and then somehow, you know, um, it, you know however, it, it's recollected or appears here. And then you have, you know, Augustine, who would come out and say, well, I do believe there's a universal. This is Aristotelian too. But the reality is that it only ever exists in a particular thing. So yes, there is a form for apples, the, perf the perfection of an apple, but it never exists on itself somewhere else. It only exists in any particular apple that we see. You know, but then along came nominalism, and nominalism said these are all just categories that we conveniently put things into. You know, This is a chair, and that's a chair. And they're both chairs, but we're just chairs because we categorize them like that way. There's nothing between them that makes it a chair or not a chair. Um, that sounds like it's all pedantic and it sounds like, you know, who really cares, that type of thing. But it changes everything once you start putting into, like, the categories, which is why we spend a little bit of time talking about <coughs> natural kinds and social kinds. Because if you are going to call it, you know, there are things that are socially constructed in our world. If you're going to call almost everything socially constructed, then you really can't put your finger on it. You, if, you know, if we can, in a metaphorical way, if we can personify the world and culture over time, that's kind of like what he's hitting at here. So whatever, you know, was this or that, just pick it. I, mean, I don't care if you want to talk about, you know, um, sex and gender, if you want to talk about um, other aspects of scientific community, whatever was true back then, it can't be the same now because we've constructed it. And if they constructed it back then, we're reconstructing in here, but we also don't have any control over who's going to reconstruct it in the future, but from Parfit's way, who cares? Because there's going to be a continuity through the whole thing, but there was never an essence there to begin with, right? So that, in a sense, it, it's based on, on a view of nominalism, you know, which is the modern era where there are no essences to things. There's nothing essential about something, per se. Um, so all he's 
at least in my view, if I understand them correctly, and if I'm maybe I'm overgeneralizing, is if we took like that whole theory of nominalism over the time period and then put it into the human person over the span of their life, it's sort of the same thing. You know, things change, but you'll construct that as you go. Now, it's not like wild construction. You can't construct yourself and say I'm something entirely different, but it's it's just that, you know, remember it's the stream per se. It's, you know, and it's not necessarily, I mean, it's a stream rather than these branches. So it's not like you had to, like, put half down each side. You know, it's not like, if you, like, if you really wanted to play out his theory, you'd have to have some wild-looking family tree. You know, so this is the original you back here. We'll just pick a time, you know, when you were one month old. And then all the different, it just kept branching and branching and branching and branching until you get to the other end where you might have, you know, I don't know, 30,000 different little, you know, ends on there, and all those things are aspects of you. And he's like, well, that's, that branch theory would be different if you talked about it in terms of a stream, so that there's not exactly, we're not trying to preserve that original. So everything doesn't go back to that original thing. All we're trying to say is that there's a connection between this and the original. But that's all there is, you know. You couldn't do that if you believe that there was some central essence to your own person, right? Which is probably, you know, again, it could be that's why he's attracted the stand of Buddhism, but then, like Carlos said, if you bring Buddhism back, it, it, its idea of suffering, and the idea is to overcome that by, you know, suppressing pleasures and those things that might create suffering, and if, and if an idea of self adds to the suffering, well, then that's something that's got to go, all right, so it's very internally consistent, okay, I think it's at least that, whether you agree or not, so no permanent self, um, you're simply connected to something to the future, um, but it's not that you're not there, and it's not that you're not some reality. It's just that it's this no-self that has continued. And remember, this no-self has to be true, you know, asynchronous. Like, in other words, um, it doesn't, you know, over time or even now. You have the same person from just this moment, right? I mean, if you get somebody who's really, like, in the philosophy of time, you, you can't even kind of grasp it. Every time you say it's now, that moment's already passed, that type of thing. Um, so this is sort of his plan. Again, I didn't build the whole thought experiments out the way he did because I was more interested in giving you the flavor of what he thought rather than trying to understand it. But before we head out, what do you think? I mean, what's your impressions of this? What issues do you see with it? Do you see how it's connected to like his denouncing of utilitarianism? I mean, utilitarianism is always like to provide some future good. He's like, almost like that doesn't fit, you know. That's almost like in, in, I'm worrying about my future self. And he's not like saying uh, you shouldn't be worried in the sense to take care of your health, right? He doesn't mean like that. It, it's almost like the future self is not really going to be you because it's almost going to be like another part. And I don't know, I kept trying to think of an analogy that would work. I don't know if you can... Think of like, you know, go back to the ship of Theseus and maybe you just keep adding parts to it. I don't know. Maybe that would be something I'd have to play out. But um, anyway, it's part of a discussion. Anybody have anything on it? What do you think? I'm curious. Come on, young critics, critical philosophers. Um, I remember you said something like, if there's no essence of a self, then the relationships between ourselves and others is more important. But yes. What? But what if, like, others, like, they are no more who they are used to be, so they are also changing? Well, you're right, but I guess that he would probably say that it's that momentary relation that is more power mount, right? That's, that's the most thing. In other words, it, you know, it, you know, okay, once you detach a memory, and some of this is, there's truth to some of this. Once you detach the memory from experience, the memory can theoretically be transferred, then other people can share in that, all right? So other people can almost have a sharing in ourselves that we couldn't do otherwise. You know, if you got... So, and now, let me say something. You know, um, there's a lot of different versions, and I've never, like, flat out told you what I think in all of this, but there's a lot of different ways that you can come about that. Like, but what is the relationship between the one and the many? We've always kind of struggled with that, you know, is how, how am I related to other people? You know, so this kind of undoes certain things. It undoes certain differences between us. It doesn't make them as paramount. It just makes... Our interconnected, you know, our interconnectedness, um, somewhat important. Um, so it, I would say the way I was reading it was almost like this transfer of memory would be the thing that not only that's what survives. It's not. It's like in other words, okay. So when I die, you know, 
I will survive then within my children and those who knew me. You know, now it's interesting, like, there's a prayer, if anybody here is Orthodox, uh, Christian, when someone dies, they typically say, may your memory be eternal. I mean, so, what I found is a lot of these people, if, if you don't have a broad enough things, they haven't, like, let me put it this way. I have some friends that are diehard atheists, and that's perfectly fine, but when I'm speaking to them, they come up with certain things, and I tell them, I can tell you who wrote about that in, I think it was 180 A.D.? They have no idea. It almost seems like it's been discovered, but there's already stuff out there. I thought about that with him. So I think you're right. He's talking about the interconnectedness of other people. But I would question, do you need to do this in order to show that? I kind of like that idea that my memories can be somewhere else. I just don't... But see, I don't know how I get past it. It's their memory of me. It's not my memory that they have. You know what I mean? But did I say anything, or was there something else that you were driving at with that that I didn't pick up on? You know, what did you think about that? I mean, that's sort of odd, right? I mean, somebody can have an experience of me. They can even have a, what we might call a pseudo-memory and such. But this idea of me transferring my memory into somebody else, <laughs> I don't know. But do you see, okay, so, you know, think about some of the things we've talked about so far. Like, remember, um, oh, my mind just went blank, the guy with the bat, um, Thomas Nagel, I think it was. You know, how would you have any experience of being a bat? You can't. You can only have an experience of yourself of what it'd like to be a bat. <laughs> You'd have to be that thing to have that same experience. You know, you see that even in sociological studies. It's called ethnographic studies, right? I mean, it's one thing for a cultural anthropologist to study another culture. It's another thing is say, I'm just going to live with that culture for the next 30 years. I mean, that's going to be an entirely different understanding. That gets a little closer to Nagel's, I'll be the bat. You know, so what do you do then? Like, you know, how, how are we connected and how do we share these experiences? You know, maybe throwing something else out there. Um, but if you don't have an essence, like if there's not an essence to humanity, then you can't, how do you call what's common? You're going to have a difficult time doing that. You might be able to say, well, there's still things that are good for us as human beings, and those things are still good ethical to work towards, and he does that, right? But then you almost get, like, in the Kantian deontology, right? We have to come up and have some idea of what would be a universal categorical imperative. Well, don't lie. So I don't want you to lie to me, and you don't want me to lie to you, so let's all agree not to lie. You know, and you're almost into some contractual thing. Um, so there's, there's really, it gets difficult to play some of this out. Um, I think he's, he's offered some insights. It doesn't really move me. I mean, if you want, in all honesty. But I, I, find, him, I find it to be very intelligent. I find it to be um, clever. I don't mean that in a demeaning way. Uh, interesting. I'm just not a big fan of thought experiments. They get old. Um, because, like, for instance, I've known T.J. 